Good day. This is Inside Law, and I'm your host, Gerald Goldfarb. Inside Law, as some of the regular viewers know, is a television discussion and interview program in which we try to uh, let the uh, public know what's uh, really happening inside the legal system. There are a lot of television programs these days which portray a fictionalized account of how uh, the legal system works, and we try to show uh, what's happening in a bit more realistic way so the uh, public gets a fuller understanding of the uh, system. Uh, I'm very happy to have as a, a guest uh, today Michael Feuer. Michael is a young man, but a man of very substantial accomplishments. He's the executive director of Bet Sedek Legal Services. Michael will be telling us more about Bet Sedek Legal Services as the show progresses. Uh, just to give you a little bit of Michael's background, uh, he's a graduate uh, of Harvard College and the Harvard Law School. He worked for an eminent Los Angeles uh, law firm. He was a clerk to uh, Justice Joseph Grodin when Justice Grodin was on the California Supreme Court and now uh, runs Betsetic uh, Legal Services as executive director, which means he's running uh, quite a substantial size uh, law firm. So uh, I'm very happy to have you uh, with us today, Michael. And maybe we can start off by giving us uh, a sort of an overview of uh, Betsetic Legal Services. First of all, I'd like to know what Betsetic Legal Services means. Well, Betsetic, Jerry, means House of Justice. And that's really what we are to the approximately 9,000 clients who come to our doors every year looking for help. We provide free legal services to these people. We are the provider of legal services for the elderly, for both the city and the county of Los Angeles, among other things. So about two-thirds of our clients are over 60 years old. And there are parents and our grandparents, really, and that's how we, we try to treat them at Betsetic. When they come to us with a landlord-tenant problem or a government benefits issue, if they're the victim of a consumer fraud or if they're suffering from elder abuse, uh, they come to Betsetic and we try to give them a sense of power, of control over their lives as we represent them in court or in an administrative hearing. Well, uh, where do you have, do you have offices? Uh, where are your offices? Well, we have our main office, which is uh, in the Fairfax area at 145 South Fairfax, across from Farmer's Market. Uh, we also have an office in the San Fernando Valley on Victory Boulevard in North Hollywood. Um, from those two offices, we go to senior citizen centers throughout the city and the county of Los Angeles. So your viewers might see Beth Sedek uh, in Lancaster or in Claremont or in South Central Los Angeles or in East L.A. Uh, we're there to go to people who need help. We also provide uh, house calls to people. We're one of the rare entities that still does that. Uh, if people are homebound or institution bound, we'll go to their bedside if that's what, what's required. The doctors won't even do that. Then the you tell me the lawyers are doing it. Yeah, now. For, for free, in fact. Um, and uh, we're doing it because uh, we really care about the elderly poor. Uh, and indeed poor people generally in the city and the county of Los Angeles. Well, if I understand you right then, that if you're in an older person's community center somewhere in, uh, uh, I don't know, East Los Angeles, uh, might there be a Betsetic lawyer coming there once a week or once a month or something like well, that? Well, that's right. We have regularly scheduled appointments, and if uh, one is a, a constituent of a senior center, they can make an appointment to come see one of our attorneys or paralegals right there at the senior center where they might be also getting a meal for instance. Mm -hmm. So it's convenient for people to come to Betsetic. Of course, they can also come on a walk-in basis to our main office on Fairfax or in North Hollywood. Well, I mean, do you have to be uh, poor to use a Betsetic lawyer? Do you, do you check their income tax returns? Well, we don't generally check their income tax returns, Jerry, but we do indeed uh, require that the people who come to us be poor. We get a number of government grants that set guidelines for the clients that we can serve. So we do ask people to show some substantiation that uh, they do fit within those guidelines and that they also have the kind of case that we handle uh, when they come to see us. And how many, uh, how many lawyers in the, how, what's the personnel breakdown? How many lawyers, paralegals do you have? Well, we've got 12 full-time lawyers and nine paralegals among a 45-person staff. Uh, in addition to that, we have 200 volunteers, and that makes Betsetic a very community-oriented, kind of a homey place, because a number of our volunteers who do support and clerical work, for example, are themselves senior citizens, helping other senior citizens. So you might see your grandmother behind the reception desk helping someone who comes in who themselves could be a, an elderly relative of yours. Um, at the same time, we 
uh, engage the community, the legal community. We have a number of volunteer attorneys who work with us, about 150 volunteer attorneys. Who work, who work, uh, who, who take on cases of some of your clients? That's right. Who might be doing client intake, which is the initial fact-finding interview, and then taking the case back to the law firm mm -hmm. where they work. We might refer cases to them. And they do this for free? And they do that for Don't, free When as they well. get your client into their office, maybe they put the arm on the client for some money. <laughs> that they wouldn't do. <laughs> All right. um, but uh, it is, it's, it's really important to us that we continue to grow in the number of volunteer attorneys who work with us because our client base continues to grow and our funding sources are not giving us the money that we we need to better serve the elderly poor of this community. Well, why aren't your funding sources giving you the money you need? Well, we get funding from a number of different entities. We get money from the federal government and from the county and the city of Los Angeles, from West Hollywood, from the United Way, from private donations and from the Jewish Federation. We get a number of different funding sources who help us, but these are tough times for the government, for example. They, in the rush to cut the deficit, programs like Beth Sedek are being directly cut despite the fact that we have been noted for being especially efficient in the services we provide uh, monetarily because we use volunteers so much. Now, it, 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 the, uh, traditionally my understanding was that when people uh, needed free legal services in the civil uh, side of the law, we know there's a big structure of free legal services on the criminal side, but on the civil side, people used to go to the Legal Aid Society. Do, do we still have a Legal Aid Society in Los Angeles? And what's the difference between Legal Aid and what Betsetic does? Well, we do have a Legal Aid Society in Los Angeles and a group called Public Council, which is the LA County Bar Association's uh, formal pro bono network, as well as Betsetic and other organizations. But we all serve different functions and different client bases. As I mentioned, for example, our focus, our special expertise is on serving the elderly, although we serve people of all ages age groups. The Legal Aid Foundation of Los Angeles has a little more general focus, as does public counsel. Some groups do work that others don't do. We don't do immigration work, for example, and public counsel does. Mm -hmm. So this network complements each uh, in individual groups complement each other, I think, in this well, network. What are the special needs that elderly people have that other poor people don't have? Well, for example, Beth Sedek has a nursing home advocacy project, the sole purpose of which is to ensure that people living in nursing homes live in humane conditions and have their rights protected. Uh, obviously, the elderly are the most likely people to live in nursing homes and retirement homes. Um, elderly people also have a difficulty sometimes in communicating what their problems are, and we're especially sensitive to some of those issues. Uh, we have expertise with clients who come who may have a relative with Alzheimer's disease, for example, or require a conservatorship. Um, some people come to us uh, interested in putting together what is in the vernacular called a living will, if they have concern about having control over the way they are cared for medically if they ever get to the stage where that's an issue. Um, the elderly come with a number of different problems, and I, I'm very proud to say that, that we do a very effective job in meeting their needs. Well, I, I'm sure that you do, and I know that you do, and I'm, I'm really impressed by the kind of work that Beth Sedek does. I myself have a, an elderly great aunt in a nursing home, and I see that the folks there do need, uh, do need some specialized uh, assistance. My understanding is that really Beth Sedek breaks down to two kinds of legal work. One for the individual person with a legal problem, and also what you call impact litigation, which takes sort of a universe or a group of persons with a similar problem and tries to protect their rights. Could you tell us a little bit about what's meant by impact litigation, how it works? Sure. Impact litigation uh, is that's a term for cases that affect large classes of people. And uh, Beth Sedek sort of traditionally got its start in doing cases that serve one client at a time. And that is still the bread and butter of what we do. We never want to turn away eligible clients who have problems on an individual basis. By the same token, though, we can be especially efficient often in meeting the needs of poor people when we uh, bring a lawsuit that affects a large group at one time. And in fact, we're, in, ter in terms of our community work, we're trying very much to engage law firms, major law firms, uh, in sort of a team effort with us to multiply the efficiency of our resources to bring a case. For example, we have a case now um, involving a number of mentally disabled residents of a board and care facility. Board and care facilities being uh, institutions where people who don't require nursing home care but do require some structure live. Uh, the state is seeking to evict those residents from the board and care facility in which they live without 
what we would call due process, without having those tenants have a right to be heard. Were they serving a three-day notice on them, pay well, rent or quit? Well, at some point, the, the state intends to direct the board and care facility to issue just that sort of notice, actually a 30-day notice, mm -hmm. to leave the facility. And that is all the process to which those people are currently entitled mm -hmm. under the way the state regulations work. And we want to change now, that. Now, wait, what sort of people are these? Are these people with mental uh, disabilities? Th these are people with mental disabilities, some of whom have been homeless before being able to enter into the facility where they live now. And they're really flourishing in that facility, along with the other residents there's a nice mix, and uh, we want to maintain their homes for them and also establish as a statewide manner that individuals who reside in boarding care facilities and in nursing homes can get to be heard before something as substantial in their, in their lives, their, their housing, is, is changed, is removed from their lives. Well, you mean they don't have the same rights as anybody else who gets a 30-day notice? Well, it, it's, it's a complicated procedure that they would be able to go through, but it would not ever give them the right to challenge the determination made by the state that they ought not live in the facility where they're living now. And it's that right that we want to vindicate for them, and we're going to do it through the courts if we have to. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's a good example. Are there any other examples of impact litigation that... Uh, you're handling at Betsetic these days. Well, let me give you one that we handled a couple of years ago that also I think expresses the kind of commitment Betsetic has. Uh, we had a client who came to us. Uh, she was a victim of the Holocaust. Uh, she was smuggled out of the Warsaw Ghetto in a coffin that had been nailed shut. And uh, as a result of the experiences that she had during World War II in a concentration camp, uh, she had both mental and physical disabilities, uh, was receiving SSI, uh, Supplemental Security Income from our federal government, public benefits. Uh, that was going along just fine. Then the German government established a program to aid Holocaust survivors, and they began giving our client monthly payments as well. Well, our government found out about the German reparations payments and began to deduct on a dollar-for-dollar -dollar basis those benefits which she was receiving from Germany from her SSI check. So in other words, the government was actually taking her German money in effect. That, that was the effect. It That's was coming, precisely it was right. Coming, the German money was coming into her pocket, but the SSI money was coming out of her pocket back exactly. to the Treasury. That's exactly right. And we thought that was an appalling situation. She came to us asking for help uh, on behalf of a whole class of Holocaust survivors who themselves were in a similar predicament. Um, Beth Sedek took her case, and it took us four years. We lost six times in administrative and judicial context, <laughs> but we were tenacious about it, and finally we won. We won in an opinion by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeal for the United States, and we established for the first time, as a nationwide matter, once the Social Security Administration caught up with the ruling, that Holocaust survivors are entitled to the full range of public benefits. And that's the kind of case that Beth Sedek's proud of. Yeah, that's a great case. It's so wonderful. The, the government is so aggressive sometimes. Uh, the bureaucracy is so aggressive. It's important to have uh, lawyers around who are willing to stand up uh, for it, uh, for the people. Uh, there was also an interesting case you had in, uh, involving uh, older, li older people living in the Venice area that that's, I'd like to right. hear a little about. Well, that's right, Jerry. We had a, a case involving a number of elderly tenants of a residential hotel on the Venice boardwalk. And uh, these people lived there for two or three decades, some of them. Uh, right before the Olympics, the owner sought to raise the building and in its place erect a high-rise hotel. Uh, we obtained an injunction that kept the owner from doing that in 1984. And now I'm proud to say that just a few months ago, we finally settled the case in a way that I think our, our tenants are especially pleased about. They can live in the hotel for the rest of their lives at their current rents. In addition, they will get to receive cash payments. The hotel in which they live is going to be substantially refurbished. Uh, it's a tremendous victory for them. Uh, and we did it in a way where there wasn't a lot of animosity between the owner of the building and our clients. In fact, just the reverse. I think our involvement helps sensitize the owner of the building to the needs of our clients. Um, and that, I think, is a tremendous model for landlord-tenant uh, issues city and indeed countywide. We should be looking to try to, to de-escalate some of the tension between landlords and tenants mm -hmm. through this kind of work. And, and we are not in the business of trying to foment some discontent among people. We're trying to protect their rights and ensure that tenants as well as landlords know the rights that they have. Mm -hmm. um, and people often don't know their rights. They are often frightened, especially the older people and the poorer people, aren't they? 
Oh, no question. You must be doing some psychotherapy over there at Betsetic besides doing lawyer's work. Well, I'll tell you, you know, when a, when a client first comes to our doors, the first person that they see is generally one of our senior citizen volunteers who takes them through the initial screening process. Mm -hmm. And I think that that in itself has a, a very nice comforting effect. I mean, literally the people that they are, our clients first come in contact with are grandmothers and grandfathers themselves. Uh, when the client is ultimately interviewed, uh, they're often interviewed by one of our volunteers who again is in the business not only of learning the facts, but also trying to allay some of the anxiety that our clients come in with. They're specially trained for that. Mm -hmm. um, so as I say, uh, our board president is fond of saying that when she first came to Batsetic, she noticed the stark difference between the attitudes that clients had when they first walked in the doors mm -hmm. and the feeling of security they, f they seemed to exude when they left our organization. And, and that's something that we're always going to strive to achieve at Batsetic. So it's really kind of, besides providing legal services, is a kind of community building that's going on here, isn't there? Oh, absolutely. And I'll bet some of your, do you have, uh, you have reunion parties? I'll bet your clients uh, when they're happy with your services, do they come back and, uh, and visit or refer their friends, that sort of thing? Well, for example, in the case on the boardwalk I described to you, uh, I just received a couple hand-painted oils from a couple of our, well, from one of our clients who herself is a senior citizen and what she does now for therapy is to do a little mm -hmm. painting and she, this was her way of trying to, to give back to us. Some of the most touching payment uh, that we get from clients, and of course clients aren't required to pay anything for our services, but some of the most touching contributions we get are from clients who we know are really giving their last dollar or two to some expression of gratitude or a painting that they've done, or come back and say, can you please come speak to a group of friends of mine? Mm -hmm. um, that's something that really means a lot to us. Do you do public speaking around the community, Michael? Different, uh, different clubs or groups? Oh, sure. Um, groups ranging from Kiwanis clubs to groups of senior citizens, often mm -hmm. uh, uh, synagogues and churches, a uh, variety of places. Mm -hmm. I just want to be clear that even though the name Bet Sedek is a, uh, it's from the Hebrew language, your, your clients are not at all restricted in any uh, religious manner, are they? Oh, no, not at all. We are a purely non-sectarian provider of services. In fact, if you would walk into our intake room, our reception area, uh, you or any of your viewers would see a real demographic cross-section of Los Angeles. In one corner might be an Hispanic family, across from them might be a black couple, next to them a Russian Jewish couple speaking in Yiddish. Uh, across the way might be a couple of Falasha Jews from Ethiopia, as we had last week. Um, it's a real cross-section of the ethnic and racial and religious diversity of Los Angeles. All you have to do is be poor. That's right. And, uh, and Betsetic services can be utilized. I think it's real important for the public to realize that. I know there are a lot of people out there who are confused and frightened. The legal system is such a mysterious thing to most people. And I think it's good to know that there are places like the Legal Aid Society or like Betsetic Legal Services where uh, people can go and, uh, and get some assistance and get some guidance. And I imagine that there are some cases that you refer out to other lawyers that you don't uh, handle in-house, is that right? Oh, sure. Uh, there are cases, for example, immigration matters or criminal law matters or contested family law issues that come to us, and we don't handle those kinds mm -hmm. of cases, but we no client ever leaves Betsetic mm -hmm. totally without any assistance. We provide each of our clients at least with an extensive referral list and often mm -hmm. call organizations for them so that they know where they can go for help even in the rare instance that Beth said it can't provide the help they need. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, this is great, Michael. And but I, what, I, what I'm interested to know also is you're a uh, you're a young lawyer, and uh, I see from your resume you're a highly accomplished uh, person. How is it that you uh, that you're working for a, a uh, that you're uh, the executive director of Beth Sedek and and why aren't you working for some instead some big law firm and making I'm sure twice as much money as you're making now? Well, I. What's the matter? You're not you're out of step with your generation, Michael. Yeah, about that. Um, well, you know, it. it my father, uh, I kind of came to Bedsetic through a, a lesson my dad taught me. He was a survivor of a Nazi prisoner of war camp during World War II, mm -hmm. and uh, having survived that experience, my dad said to me uh, that he chose a career in public education. He's now a school principal because he wanted to do the most important work in the world, and that work for him was the training of young kids. But that lesson that each of us ought to aspire to do the most important work in the world is really what led me to Betsetic. As you mentioned, I did work uh, for a law firm downtown, and uh, as a professional matter, there were a lot of rewards associated with that, not only monetarily, but intellectually and in other ways. Um, but I cannot imagine any more important work 
than serving the legal needs of the elderly poor of our community. And I'm just actually very grateful to have the opportunity to do just that. The, uh, I was uh, reading an article in the uh, lawyer's newspaper the other day, and uh, uh, the lawyers, by the way, folks have their own newspaper. And the headline said, lawyers bemoan bad public image, but split on whys. Uh, I think uh, you're an example, and Beth Seddick's an example of the good side of uh, lawyers. Uh, but what are your, what's your view on the whys? Do you think we do have a bad public image, we lawyers, and if so, why? Well, I think certainly a certain segment of lawyers do, uh, do not enjoy the kind of public uh, image that they could. Um, but uh, there is uh, an increasing emphasis, and it's disquieting to those of us who are in legal services, um, that the, the trend is for major law firms to really focus on the bottom line. Uh, and law is becoming more and more just another business. And none of us went to law school to engage in just another business. We went to law school to be part of a profession that was deeply involved with justice. And uh, law and justice are, there's some disjunction between those two concepts now, I think, in the legal practice. And the public is, is I think, sensitive to that disjunction, even if no one necessarily articulates it that way. Um, it's that bottom line emphasis that we need to change. And indeed, it's vital for organizations like ours that that does change, because we rely, as I mentioned, so heavily on the work of private practitioners who volunteer their time to work with our staff and our clients. And, uh, I think if more and more lawyers were to do that and to be known for doing that, the public image of lawyers would improve dramatically. Mm -hmm. And do you have trouble getting volunteers, Michael? Well, it's interesting. Uh, in the past year, we've actually enjoyed a real increase in the number of volunteers who've come to us, while other organizations, uh, unfortunately, are not enjoying the same success, in part because we are doing a lot of things at our organization to sustain the interest and involvement of our volunteers. They are contributing actively to the good of our clients. We want to develop their professional uh, interests by having seminars for them, uh, free engagements. They can come to Bedsetic and learn about how to develop their expertise. Uh, we train them at Bedsetic. And I think all those uh, elements of our practice, the hallmark of our volunteer program, are attracting more and more attorneys to our program. But we still need many more. I'm always out beating the bushes to find more attorneys to help our clients who continue to grow in number. Mm -hmm. And do you think that, do you think there's any um, change, uh, you're a young lawyer, relatively young lawyer, do you, do you notice any change happening among your peers in terms of their devotion to public service and perhaps uh, less uh, infatuation with uh, big money and big law firms? Uh, I'll tell you that the frustration that I know that some young lawyers face in firms where the bottom line is the focus is they want to do pro bono work, but it isn't clear that that encouragement, which used to exist from the upper levels of law firms, still is coming through. And, and um, I hope that that dynamic changes some. I also hope that law schools themselves are, begin to change their curricula to more and more focus on law other than necessarily the traditional LA law corporate practice. Mm -hmm. So the students are aware of the vast array of opportunities. Uh, you know, Derek Bach, the president of Harvard, uh, was quoted a couple years ago as saying that there are not enough crea creative people entering other professions besides law. They go to law school without really thinking about other possibilities out there. Um, the premise underlying those remarks, that there are enough lawyers to serve the community, is in my view inaccurate. Um, the, uh, that's true for the corporate sector. It is clearly untrue for the vast majority of poor and middle class citizens of our community who don't have adequate legal service available to them. I mean, it is troubling. The middle class is really in a box in a way. If you're rich or you're a corporation, you have uh, many, many high-priced lawyers to choose from. And if you're poor, well, you can go to Betsetic or you can go to Legal Aid and you can get some good service. But the middle class or lower middle class person is in something of a box these days, isn't he? Well, that's true. Uh, and uh, Betsetic, because of the nature of our funding sources, really can't do anything about that. Um, uh, our, the restrictions uh, come with our funding we have no control over. Um, but I, I do believe that there is a, a widening gap, as you described, that could be filled by a creative practitioner who would step in to fill the void. I know that there are organizations that provide legal services on a relatively low cost basis. Um, there's still not enough of those around that provide truly quality services to the people that they purport to serve. Hmm. Uh, I notice also that you clerked for a year on the California Supreme Court. We, we don't have much time left, but 
Maybe you can give me a little bit. I've always wondered what goes on deep in the bowels of the California Supreme Court, uh, how they make their decisions and whether they really look at these cases. They have a huge volume of, of work. They have death cases which have huge records. They have disbarment matters. Do you think they have enough time and space to really think about the problems and really oversee the legal system in California? Well, from my experience, I'll tell you that I think that the justices of the court do as good a job as we could expect given the relatively limited resources that the court has. But the death penalty cases, for example, on which I did some work, as do all law clerks um, in, in the court, uh, are just monsters to deal with. They are, are immense records to, to sift through and uh, briefs to read that are three or four hundred pages long. Uh, most judges put their stamp on the decisions that come out of that or any other court um, in a very strong way. But they don't have the resources, I don't think, in our Supreme Court or elsewhere to handle the massive flow of cases that come in and to deal with all the important issues that come before them in a timely manner. Uh, I hope the public becomes more aware of uh, the gridlock that's developing at that and other courts and de begins to devote adequate resources to ensuring that our justice system really works. Uh, Joan Klein was on our show last week and she said, and I think quite accurately, that the court system, the lawyers may be making money, but the court system itself is starved for funds. Well, sure. And that's why uh, there's gridlock in the Supreme Court and there's gridlock in the uh, Superior Court as well. Our program is uh, running uh, toward its end now. And I simply want to thank you uh, very much for being on the show, Michael. Thanks, I think Jack. that it's uh, people like you and organizations like Betsedek that show that uh, our legal system uh, shouldn't have a terrible image at all. Uh, there are some things that aren't so good, but there are some things that are wonderful that are going on. And the public should know that there are uh, uh, organizations that provide free legal services for people who need them uh, and are upholding the legal services tradition of doing justice for people who are in need. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for being on our show today. If you have any comments or uh, things you want to communicate to us, Please write to us, care of this station. This has been Inside Law. I am your host, Gerald Goldfarb. Good day. For further information, please call Inside Law at area code 213-285-8599.